400 gig is finally here. At Pro Labs, we're very excited about this new technology, but we also recognize that careful consideration is required for a successful migration to 400 gig. Now I'd like to introduce our very own global product line manager, Ray Hagen, who's going to give you a full walkthrough of 400 gig architectures and everything you need to know about them. Hi, my name is Ray Hagen. I'm the global product line manager for Pro Labs. We're here today to talk about 400 gig architectures and what you need to know as you deploy 400 gig. Our agenda today is to discuss, you know, a few key themes. Our four foundations where we talk about modulation, form factors, interfaces, connectors, things that are really critical to deploying 400 gig. We look forward to that, applying that to real world networks and data centers and service providers. How are the real practical things you need to know as you deploy 400 gig? And we'll also talk a bit about what's beyond 400 gig, what lies beyond. So we look to our 400 gig foundations and here's where we really want to talk about hows and the whys of why things developed the way they did and what does that mean to you? So as the 400 gig standards were developing, there was a, quite frankly, a lot of competing standards at work. So there were things like optical standards. How are those gonna work out? There were, you know, how's this gonna roll down to 100 gig? Then also what form factors would be used for 400 gig transceivers. OSFP, QSFP, DD, even MU, QSFP, DSFP, SFP, DD, CFP8 were all standards that were in the queue, ready to go for 400 gig. And then to take that kind of alphabet soup, if you will, to the next level, there's a whole host of new connector types that were also being introduced with 400 gigs. So you've got your MPO12, MPO16, your standard duplex LC and a new CS connector that were all introduced that really um, add a lot of complexity to a 400 gig de deployment. So if we look at our 400 gig foundations um, and form factors, there were really three form factors that bubbled to the top um, that you know switches were developed to around CFP8, the OSFP, and the QSFP 56DD connector. The real differences here what really is in the power and the heat and thermal management, if you will. QSFP 56DD uses a little less power, has an indirect thermal management, meaning that it's a little more advantageous for the switch providers or when they're developing switches and routers around these transceivers to be able to you know, utilize the same um, thermal management components they use for the QSFP 2800 gig technology. So hence the QSFP 56DD Otherwise, uh, we're going to be calling moving forward here as the QSFP DD form factor has been, uh, I guess, crowned, if you will, as the winner of the form factor battle. If there is such a battle, the other two um, form factors perhaps are not going away. I think there's going to be a market for these as we look to beyond 400 gig. But right now, this is going to be the uh, QSFP 56 DD is the is the the winner, if you will. So even though we think we had a clear winner within that QSFP DD form factor, there's still some variation, if you will. There are actually three different hardware types, type one, type two, and type 2A. The type two transceiver is the perhaps the most commonly deployed today. I think the real difference there is just the size. It, it protrudes a bit further out from the faceplate than the type one. The type one is a little closer in size to the, the standard QSFP 2800 gig transceiver. And uh, to probably oversimplify the reasons why it just, you know, you need to I guess, put more components into a package, you may need a little bit extra space there. The Type 2A is a newer addition to it um, to take care of thermal management. I believe that's going to be in relation to upcoming uh, 400 gig ZR um, things down the road. So it needs a different, uh, needs a heat sink on the top of it to, to take care of the thermal management down the road. Uh, on top of that, uh, there is a common management information system used with uh, these transceivers and this uh, Believe it or not, there are two two revisions of this out there in the market today. And uh, quite frankly, if you're a, a consumer of 400 gig transceivers to deploy in your switches and routers and other network elements, you don't really need to worry about this a whole lot. I think where, where it's gonna come into play for you is when if you're where you're consuming your technology, if you're buying from a, a third party supplier, you may need to ask a question, which CMI, CMIS are you using? And make sure that's the same CMIS that your OEM is using. So then we move on to modulation. And PAM4 um, modulation is perhaps the biggest change here with 400 gig that 
networks are going to find opposed to, you know, the 100 gig migration a few years ago. So PAM4 is a generational shift in optical networking. It has far reaching impact, far beyond 400 gig. It goes all the way to 200 gig and 100 gig. It's gonna impact each section of your network once you deploy PAM4. So what does that mean? So from non-return to zero encoding, so that's a, a one step, if you will, encoding um, algorithm, where you're simply going up and down to a PAM4, which is a four step, demonstrated here by the graph. And uh, how this is manifested, if you will, is in the optical signal. You can see by the eye diagrams on the uh, right-hand side of the slide that uh, you can see both steps in a NRZ eye diagram on top. And at the bottom, you can see all four steps in the PAM4 eye diagram. So again, this is gonna be a fundamental shift in how um, transceivers are deployed for 400 gig. And as you look to um, do to the applications of the um, aggregation and breakouts and it has everything rolls from the edge into the core. So we'll get into that, all those are application section. So where PAM4 has a big impact is on the transceiver interfaces. We've got the available interfaces on the multi-mode side, the SR8, and that uses a new MPO16 connector, a max of 100 meters. On the electrical side, it has 8 by 50 PAM4 electrical signaling, whereas on the optical side, it also has 8 by 50 PAM4 um, optical signaling. And these are eight, eight transmit, eight receive pairs um, in that fiber connection. We're moving to the, the single mode side. You know, we have a couple of uh, MPO type connectors or parallel type modules, um, transceivers, the DR4 and the DR4 Plus. You know, these transceivers use the MPO12 connector, much like we have accustomed to for, um, for uh, breakout um, connections over the years, but you know, for the 500 meter and two kilometer reaches. Now, where things get interesting here is with the FR4 and LR4, you know, these are used duplex LCs. And again, these are still four by 100 optical on the PAM4 side, but these multiplex those four lanes onto the single fiber for their connection. All these, all these transceivers are all eight by 50 gig PAM4 on the electrical side. So as we look at what's next, right? For these developing 400 gig interfaces, there's a number of them. You've got your PLR, PLR4, which is a four by 100 LR. So basically the same as a DR4 and DR4 plus, except for a 10 kilometer reach. You get to SR4.2 on the multi-mode side, which is uh, trying to take the place of a quote unquote bi-die connection. I'm um, using the um, MPO12 type connector, gonna have a transmit and receive on a single multi-mode fiber. And this is where, you know, OM5 fiber is gonna come in handy here for this particular connection. Then there's a few other, um, interfaces that perhaps have actually been around for a while, FR8 and LR8. And the only real difference here, in, in my opinion, is on the implementation between these and the FR4 and the LR4. On the um, optical side, you're multiplexing eight 50 gig connections um, using LAN WDM opposed to CWDM, full, CWDM on the other connections. So it's a bit of a implementation um, change there. Um, but those two interfaces, you know, I, I, DR, I'm sorry, an FR8 and an FR4, you know, obviously are not interoperable. So just something to keep in mind as you're deploying your, your transceiver technology. Then you've got the ZR on the 400 gig. Now this is um, something you're gonna see over the next year um, come to market. And this is gonna be a one by 400 gig coherent DWDM technology. So this is pretty exciting, right? This is where we're gonna have, you know, real change for um, long haul networking and beyond and from the core to the edge. Um, this is gonna be a big change over the next year or so. So as we move on, you know, we've got a slide up here with a bunch of 100 gig and 200 gig transceivers. You may say, hey, this is a 400 gig, what you need to know, why are we talking about 100 gig? Well, that's a really great question. And I think the real reason why here is that 400 gig is gonna be deployed mainly you in the core up front and in, in the main core of the network. So you're gonna to need to roll up or aggregate or break out to whatever term you wanna use your 100 gig connections into that 400 gig. So we talked about PAM4 and networking. Here's where that be becomes far reaching into the 100 gig and 200 gig world. So the DR1 
FR1 and LR1, these are single wavelength optical technologies. Sing one by 100 PAM4 optically. But on the electrical side, they are all four by 25 NRZ, QSP28 transceivers, meaning that these transceivers can um, be installed in legacy QSP28 100 gig switches deployed in the network today. You know, these transceivers help integrate those legacy switches into your new 400 gig network. So we move on to our 2 by 100 gig QSFP28 DD transceivers. Now, these are a little different transceivers. As you can see by the specs on the slide, they are NRZ both on the copper side or electrical side and on the electrical or on the optical side. So as we get into the applications where these are hand, where these are used, we'll get to understand why someone would want these types of transceivers. And then the final transceiver in the slide here is a dual Lambda um, QSFP28 PAM4 transceiver. And this is a PAM4 dual Lambda, um, means it's two 50 gig DWDM on the same fiber. So this is a, a different type of transceiver today used in a QSFP28 type environment as well. Now, the single Lambda 100 gig QSFP28 transceivers so these transceivers, um, as we mentioned, these, these are really critical in, in integrating legacy 100 gig um, infrastructure into the new 400 gig network. Now, what makes these a little different is um, inside the transceiver, there's a gearbox. And in this gearbox, it does the retiming from, from 1 by 100 PAM4 to um, 4 by 25 NRZ. And that Retiming is, is critical to the um, to making it interoperate with the switch. Now inside this gearbox is also a DSP. And this DSP contains a uh, forward air correction. That forward air correction works with uh, the 400 gig transceiver on the other end without need for FEC or FEC on the host. So FEC is done on both this transceiver and its 400 gig um, subtender on the other end very much a something you need to know as you're deploying 400 gig. I like to think of this, and again, I'm probably oversimplifying it, but I look at the two by 100 gig as a, you know, two NRZ transceiver ho transceivers in one housing. So, so let's think about that. Meaning that inside that QSFP 28 DD transceiver, essentially are two working QSFP 28 LR4 or two QSFP 28 CWDM fours. So that's an interesting way of looking at it, and that's how I helps me rationalize how this why this matters in the network. Now how this works is you can see from the, the slide there, a QSFP DD transceiver has two sets of pins. Same pins that work with uh, legacy QSFP 28, then a whole nother set of, of almost identical pins on the other side of the piece of the print circuit board that allow it to you know, essentially work two independent transceivers within one. And, and when you say that, what do you mean two independent transceivers? Well, um, this particular transceiver integrates the CS connector. Um, I mentioned that's one of the new connector types. So a CS connector essentially is two transmit and receive fiber cores, if you will, within the space of one LC connector. So those of us who are around and uh, for a long time, like myself, we remember when the LC connector came to market and it doubled the density over existing you know, SC connectors where you know, two LCs, a transmit receive pair fit in the space of one SC connector. Now, same thing is going on with the CS connector where one CS connector is fitting in the space of one LC connector. So being on the face of this QSFP 28DD transceiver, there are two transmit and receive pairs using CS connectors, allowing for this you know, independent operation of two by 100 gig um, transceivers. The QSFP DD 200 gig, now these are um, evolving standards. Um, they use PAM4 and eight by 25 gig, four by 50 gig. There's a number of different uh, thoughts out there right now how these are gonna, how this is gonna shake out. I think, uh, over the next year, we're gonna see many more 200 gig transceivers under the market. These are gonna be in various PAM4 varieties, but again, still very much um, you know, developing um, as of today. So, you know, as we talked about connectors being a, a big uh, big deal with the QSFP28DD connectors, 
we move on to you know the rest of the Warner gig transceivers and what connectors do they use? The SR8, as we mentioned, uh, uses the MPO16. It has eight transmit, eight receive pairs, as we can see by this slide. The DR4, DR4 Plus, and PLR4 will use the MPO12, and they'll have four transmit and receive pairs, um, very similar to the same scheme used in uh, QSFP Plus and QSFP28 modules um, you know, for the last several years. The QSFP DD FR4 and LR4, again, use the du duplex LC connectors, standard LC connectors. So let's move on to applications for this 400 gig technology. So this is a standard 100 gig infrastructure data center type of network. You've got your starting at the core, you've got your data center interconnect, your data center routers, your spine, your leaf, your under row, your top of rack switches and your servers. Pretty typical, very standard of how today's data centers are, are architected. So for each um, segment of the network, from the top of rack, we may have DACs, AOCs, short reach transceivers, to your, your end of row, you're gonna have maybe AOCs or SR4 type transceivers, to your uh, 500 meters, you're gonna use you know, either PSM4s or CWDM4s, all up to one, one kilometer where you have CWDM4s or LR4s, and up to your data center interconnects where you have your LR4s, ER4s, or even coherent type modules. So this is you know very basic, very standard data center architecture today. Where things uh, are interesting and, and make it very easy for the upgrade to 400 gig is that for each step in this network, there's a corresponding 400 gig transceiver type. So for each reach, you're gonna have a, a uh, arrow in the quiver, if you will, for every aspect. So as you, if you're looking to go from the core down, or if you're looking to start at the um, end, of row, end of row type switches of 400 gig, however your, wherever your deployment model may be, there's gonna be a corresponding transceiver there. So you know why that becomes very powerful is you're looking at that gives you the opportunity to upgrade your infrastructure or your data rates by four times over existing infrastructure. So to me, that's a very powerful um, way out of the gate for 400 gig. But you know, let's not forget our 100 gig um, single wavelength products we mentioned there earlier. Um, they also have a, a very big role in this uh, four by 100 infrastructure. And you know, service providers, you know, in their um, service networks also will, their architecture may look a little bit different. They may have 400 gig in the core. They push 100 gig to the edge and maybe 10 gig to the axis or maybe 25 gig to the access network. But again, a very similar model where they're going to be aggregating from the access network inward. They're gonna to need a way to roll up that bandwidth up and to take advantage of the new 400 gig core. So. As you're deploying 400 gig, there's a few things to keep in mind with the breakouts or your aggregation or your whatever you want to call it. So the 400 gig to four by 100 gig breakout architecture really does require some thoughtful planning, you know, across the entire physical layer. Consider your operability. So a de currently deployed 100 gig CWDM4 and LR4, so NRZ modulated transceivers they're not interoperable with PAM4 400 gig interfaces. That's a very big um, point to keep in mind. Your fiber cabling considerations. So the new connector, CS MPO16, you probably don't have those in your network today. You're gonna need to buy those, right? You may need to clean them. You may need to do a number, number of things that you don't do today. So also 200 gig to 200, two, two by 100 gig breakouts do offer backwards interoperability, meaning that the NRZ modulation makes those um, interoperable with legacy LR4 and CWDM4 transceivers that may be in your network today. So the fiber cabling considerations there, you may need to worry about new duplex CS connectors and you may need conversion media. Well, our first uh, architecture we're gonna look at here is just a four by 100 breakout, 500 meters. So you may have a DR4 transceiver at the switch or network element, and you'll break those out with an MPL breakout cable um, you'll go to um, four 100 gig switches, pretty straightforward. Each one of those switches will have a DR1 transceiver. So a DR4 to four DR1 transceivers, a very pretty basic breakout. And we stretch that to two kilometers. The transceiver at the network element, at the 400 gig network element, 
will be a DR4 plus transceiver. Um, you may also refer to this as a 4x100 FR1 transceiver, um, depending upon who you're talking to. Now the break MPL breakout from there will go to four FR1 transceivers at four 100 gig switches. Now where this is, um, you know, where this thing gets a little, you know, not quite as straightforward as the previous slide is that you would think the FR1 transceivers would uh, subtend off of the FR4 transceiver. Well, that's not the case. Uh, the FR4 transceiver is a duplex LC tri um, transceiver with four CWDM multiplexed uh, lanes, which quite frankly, do not, um, are not interoperable with each lane on a um, FR1 transceiver. So a little bit of a misnomer there in terms of how standards have worked in the past, but hey, it is what it is. Now, as we look at the two by one gig breakout, you know, you know, I, I promised earlier, we, we talk about why, why a customer or a network may want to do this. And a couple of reasons why, you know, they may have a very, you know, large and embedded base of LR4 CWDM4 transceivers in their in their network. They don't want to train uh, uh, thousands of installers of of which transceiver to use for which which deployment. So that's a pretty valid um, use case there. Uh, the key thing here is that the uh, QSFP 28DD um, 2 by one hard transceivers will be installed in a standard QSFP DD um, switch port being that within the same switch, you could have some of these transceivers right next to a regular 400 gig QSFP DD transceiver. So that QSFP DD slot offers a lot of flexibility and this is one of the key things it can offer. So coming off of that QSFP 28 DD transceiver, you'd have you know two um, CS patch cables or duplex CS patch cables. Um, and the other end may be an LC connector that you would connect to a patch panel or maybe even directly to another um, transceiver. Then the other end, you'd have an uh, LR4 type transceiver in this scenario with it, accepting it on an LC basis. So one QSFP 28DD transceiver on one end, two QSFP 28LR4 transceivers on the other end. And if we go down to you know two kilometers with the CWDM4, same exact deployment scenario here. So a little bit of a summary chart here in terms of what's required from a, a connectivity standpoint for these uh, scenarios. The DR4, you have a you know, single mode MPO12 on one end, four by single mode uh, LC duplex in the other, just like we've done breakout connections for a long time. With the SR8 um, transceiver on the PAM4 side, you know, I think the real issue here is gonna be the 50 gig transceivers um, on the um, far end. Those uh, those transceivers probably aren't really available very you know, rapidly in the market right now. It's going to be a while before you're going to have a PAM4 transceiver on, on optically 50 gig on, on one end with um, either NRZ or PAM4 on the copper side. So it's going to be a little while before those transceivers are readily available to perform those sorts of breakouts. On the 200 gig, you know, two by 100 side, you know, you're going to need um, um, a CWDM4 and LR4 side. You'll need for each transceiver, you need two patch cables with a duplex CS on one end and probably duplex LC on the other. Uh, there's also an SR4 2 by 100 gig transceiver also that uses an MPO24 connector. And that um, you use the uh, same MPO24 connector that's been used for um, quite some time. And that would, um, that will have you know a little different implementation than what's been used in the past where you're only using the center um, the, um, the center, I'm sorry, you're only using the outer lanes and with the middle lanes being uh, not used, going to LCs on the other end. So that's uh, something else to keep in mind. Let's explore the, this physical aspect we just, we, we just spoke about. So those MPO to LC patch cables we mentioned. So, you know, with standard breakout cables, the same sorts of breakout cables we've used for years with an MPO on one end. So you need a female, you know, connector without pins. Um, that connect directly into the transceiver. On the LC end, it'll just be a standard paired LCs available both in multi-mode and, and single mode. Uh, for the DR4 and DR4 Plus and the PLR4, you'd have the MPO12. And then for the SR8, should that day come, the MPO16. Now, if you're doing the two by one hour gig uh, transceiver, you know, here you'll need a, a 
a simple patch cable duplex CS to duplex LC. Um, pretty straightforward, two patch cables per transceiver. So some of the pros here, um, it's pretty intuitive just to patch from network element to network element. Pretty straightforward, even if you have a patch panel in between. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, they don't, don't use rack space if you're just going you know, direct connects between element to element. Um, cons, I think your complexities grow. When you're talking about things like breakout links, if you're going for a 400 gig transceiver, where are your 100 gig transceivers? Are they right next to each other? Are they in the same rack? Are they in the same row? Or are they in different rows? At that point, you're talking about things like breakout links, how we engineer those, a number of different things to, to keep in mind with that sort of um, deployment. You know, and, and quite frankly, when you're direct connecting network elements, you're reducing flexibility. You're flexing your patching down the road. So, um, you know, that's just a, a standard trade-off over the years for direct connecting versus cross-connecting, right? Is simply you're reducing some flexibility down the road. So another option you may have is on your breakout cassettes. So on the rear of the cassette, we'll take your MPO connector, um, you'll have 100 gigs um, off that, say, the DR4 or DR4 Plus or whichever um, transceiver that we broke out to, you know, LC pairs on the on the front of the cassette that you can tap into your 100 gig pairs. This is both the multi-mode and single-mode options. Um, there's capacity for three, four by breakouts within one cassette. So, you know, a lot of the pros with this is it offers, you know, takes care of some of those cons from the direct connection um, scenario. You can have standard cable links from for cassettes at the top of rack. You can run trunk cables between end of row to each rack. Very, um, very much, uh, very slick in that regard. You increase your flexibility, important cable management. Some of the cons. So one thing you have to deal with is MPO polarity, and uh, MPO polarity is would seem to be straightforward, but most people end up asking, oh gosh, start scratching their head, right? Which player do I need? Which cables do I need? Do I need crossover? Do I need straight through connectors? And the answer is all depends. All depends about what you're trying to connect. So that's uh, definitely adds to some of the complexities of uh, deploying cassettes. And it does take up rack space where you're using, um, you know, either a five inch LGX footprint or four inch um, more high density type footprint. So it does take up rack space in your deployment. So as we look ahead, what's the road ahead lies for 400 gigs? So at Pro Labs, you know, right now we're seeing that, you know, 4 gig network elements, switches and routers are, are being shipped by OEMs. They're starting to be shipped after a few years and wondering when's the shipments going to start, when are they going to start? Well, now they're, now they're happening, right? They're shipping this product out to networks, um, data centers, service providers around the world. So that's good to see. It's good to see in the market that that's happening. Now, over the next uh, few months, we're going to see, you know, supply is going to mature, technology is going to mature, the software is going to support more, more transceivers in the field. So we're going to see that technology really start to mature here over the next few months towards the promise of 400 gig is going to be delivered in network elements delivered by the OEMs. And by the end of the year, you know, we're really going to see more OEMs offering these switches, a much more uh, robust market to buy 400 gig switches, if you will. But then as we get to OEM, you know, 400 gig is, is here, it's real. We're going to have real conversations about 800 gig and what's that going to mean to our networks starting probably um, February of next year at OFC. So there's going to be a number of different uh, things to come their way, but you know, 400 gigs can be around for a long time. It's going to be a very you know, big shift in the network architecture. I think the internet is seeing, uh, you know, seeing unprecedented growth and we need to, to shore up the core of the network. So 400 gig will be here forever. Thank you so much for watching this video. For more info on 400 gig and 400 gig products, the appropriate links are down below. If you like these in-depth explainers like this one, let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more educational videos like this one. Thanks again and stay connected for the next video.